Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine. Today, I am joined by Benjamin Howard. Benjamin Howard is a reader of Current Affairs and computer science student who wrote to us because he is working on a critique of a character that our listeners and readers may be familiar with. That is Dr. Jordan Peterson, formerly of the University of Toronto, now of Twitter mostly. Benjamin Howard's critique will be found at jordanpetersoniswrong.com. When you go there now, you can sign up for the Jordan Peterson is Wrong mailing list so that when the piece of writing that Benjamin is working on drops, you will be the first to know. Benjamin Howard, thank you for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thanks for having me. So the reason I was so interested in what you are writing, and you've sent me a big chunk of it, and and it's really, really good, but I think that what makes it so interesting is you have a pretty unique perspective because you are someone who was a big Jordan Peterson fan at one point, but has changed your mind over time, and the piece that you're writing sort of helps to explain, you know, what you came to believe that this man is wrong about. But first, for any listeners who don't know or don't remember or have forgotten who Dr. Jordan Peterson is and why he is significant matters, I was hoping that maybe we could start with if someone said they hadn't heard of this man, they, and uh, you told them you were working on Jordan Peterson is wrong dot com. What would you tell them about who he is? How would you introduce him? Well, yeah, it would obviously depend on who's asking and how much they know about these things. I go to um, get feedback for my writing, and some of the people there have never heard of Peterson before, so I really have to explain it from step one. So he was a professor, as you said, at the University of Toronto, a clinical psychologist. If people are familiar with like Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth, Peterson has this kind of mythological interest and applies that to Christianity, I guess. And my impression is that he's a Christian. I don't know if he's exactly upfront about that, but he's also probably more well known for just fighting against what he sees as political correctness. And ultimately, in his eyes, it's destroying Western civilization and democracy and sort of anti-free speech uh, leftists are sort of really they want communism, but is what he thinks, I guess, but they're they guise it under the words of social justice and progress. And Yeah, he kind of burst onto the scene in uh, 2018, 2017, 2018, 2016. He wasn't internationally famous like right away, but yeah. Yeah. So between, you know, over the course of a couple of years, he went from being, I guess he was fairly well known and cited in his field, pretty prominent within psychology. Obviously, the University of Toronto is a you know, pretty top school. I know he had published a lot in academic journals, but you know, really burst onto the scene and became the subject of a lot of profiles, news stories. I think one of the things that's quite interesting about his rise to fame is that There's two parts to it, right? So there's the part you've just described, which is the critique of political correctness, the woke mind virus, the cultural Marxist or postmodern neo-Marxist, whatever, all that. But then there's the other half of it, which if you pick up his best-selling book, 12 Rules for Life, very little of that is actually in there, which can kind of surprise people because he has this massive appeal to an audience that is based not on the critique of political correctness, but on a kind of self-help pitch. Yeah, that's right. I did leave that part out, but that's very important, though, for sure. So could you explain a little bit more about that side of what he does? Okay, so it's sort of absent from my critique in terms of like talking about his self-help. And that's because I don't really have a problem with it that much. I mean, you can criticize it, I guess, but I think as far as self-help goes, it's better than a lot of what's out there, in my opinion. Like, it's very just straightforward, practical advice, and it's not for everyone, but like, I think there are certain kinds of self-help where it feels like they're just telling you what you want to hear, and you shouldn't feel bad about yourself, you know, this kind of thing, just like positive thinking. And Peterson was very 
kind of straightforwardly against that of just, no, if you're not doing well, like you kind of should feel bad about yourself and you should want to improve yourself. And if you don't, then something's wrong with you, I guess. He's extremely inspiring, I think, for his self-help. And he has a way of speaking that it it feels very like deep in his heart that like he wants you to do better for yourself. And it doesn't have that much of the politics in it. When I was writing about him, it's not really what I'm critical of him for, right? To the extent that he is just a motivational speaker, getting people who feel hopeless or who feel in a rut and trying to get them out of that rut by giving them some tough love. I don't really have that much of a problem. I don't, not all of it sounds like great advice to me. Like some of it sounds like pretty mean. And there was one thing that I was critical of when I wrote about him, which is the, some of his troll rules for life are things like, you know, stop and pet cats. And I'm like, well, who could possibly object to stop and pet cats? And one of them is like, set your house in perfect order before criticizing the world. I definitely agree. Yeah, that's that has a kind of politics to it, which is like, you know, mm. maybe you know, you shouldn't be a political actor. There's a kind of political quietism to it. But as you say, you know, this part is somewhat unobjectionable. I mean, I feel like the source of his kind of mega appeal was that he had both of these things. He wasn't just another person criticizing PC wokeness, but he was also this like motivational speaker and every, and thousands of thousands of people buy the 12 rules for life. To the extent that that is a question, I, well, it was, do you agree that his appeal, like the reason for people, you know, he develops this following, right, seems to be not just that people accept the, the political correctness critique, but that he also has this way of kind of inspiring people with this tough love philosophy. Yeah, no, for sure. That's an important aspect of it. I will say too, like, I've heard some critics of Peterson say like, well, his self-help is all just obvious. So, mm. you know, and they come across as they don't even get like why anyone would listen to his self-help or enjoy it. Because they think, oh, well, he says, clean your room. Doesn't everyone know that? But there's a certain point in your life where you don't know that, or you do know it, but you don't care about it, and you don't see why you should do it. And probably when you're younger, and you need someone to tell you, but also to explain why. I think that's mm. an important part. Peterson doesn't, well, sometimes he does, but in this example of clean your room, he gives an explanation of why it's important. And you might want to like look up his clean your room speech. I'm not going to do it, but it, it's very interesting. And maybe part of it is he kind of has a habit of making everything feel really profound and like super meaningful. And he applies that to everything, but that's part of what makes it motivating. And so if you're sort of out of sorts and lacking in motivation, and then someone comes along and sort of slaps you in the face and says, hey, this is really important, like clean your yeah. room, then you'll actually do it. But if you're, you know, your parent just sort of whatever scolds you and then doesn't explain anything, it's not very motivational. So he has a power. Like I am a very harsh critic of his. And at this point, you are too. I mean, you have Jordan Peterson is wrong.com. But I have always tried to encourage people to grasp and analyze the sources of his appeal because he has a, a real charisma too, doesn't mm -hmm. he? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no one quite like him, I think. I mean, and he's also able to weave in a lot of different topics together mm. where he's got the self-help, he's got religion, he's got psychology, and then the politics, and it's all... If you listen to like one of his lectures where he's in this lecture hall talking for like an hour, two hours, he'll kind of like go across all these different topics and kind of weave them like he's trying to give the impression that they're all unified together. But it's sort of this hodgepodge of different things that maybe aren't related, but it, it gives this feeling of, wow, this guy is knows about everything and he's just so... Mm -hmm knowledgeable and he's giving this profound insight that other people just don't have and i think there is a definitely an impression of your you're getting like genius insights from this person i think that's mm. what leads to over trusting his information 
right? Because if he's a genius, then why look into anything he says? He must just be correct, right? Right. If he's a genius, then if you don't understand or you're confused by it, it's because you don't appreciate his genius thoughts. Like you're just not smart enough to understand. <laughs> yes. I mean, a big part of my article was devoted to like the way that I think that a lot of people sort of pseudo intellectual, well, not entirely pseudo intellectual, but a lot of people mystify the obvious and make it very complicated, or they take things that don't really make sense and make them seem profound. And there are sort of there are sort of techniques for doing that. I want to ask you personally, because you know, you write your critique as an ex fan of Jordan Peterson, perhaps you could tell our listeners, if you remember how you first encountered him and mm -hmm. what it was about him that appealed to you at first. Okay, well, so my dad, he just sort of said, hey, check out this podcast. And it was Jordan Peterson's first appearance on Joe Rogan. I still feel like that podcast is almost like his greatest performance of his life or something because mm. he, he comes across as very reasonable in what he's saying and that, you know, all his critics are unreasonable and and he also comes across as that he's like he's fighting like a noble battle or something for free speech and stuff and then he also brings in you know christianity and mythology and stuff and then self-help and he's got his i don't know if you're aware of this but he has like a self-authoring suite which is like kind of a psychology if you go to selfauthoring.com, like that's his website, but it's like a one of the components of it. It's basically the idea is you could sort of clarify your thoughts by like writing a lot about your life and like reflecting on it. And I think it's a very positive thing. And so he brings that in too. And I don't know if I'm explaining it very well in terms of, but the podcast really hit me like so hard. And I was like, whoa, I've never heard anything like mm. this before, you know, and I was just instantly a fan. And then from there, listening to his podcast and so on very frequently. So so what about it do you feel spoke to you in particular? If you take us back to, you know, how you felt, what it was that you felt that you got from it. Okay. So one aspect is just him going off against political correctness. I really enjoyed mm. that. And I thought that he had done it in a way that was very unique and intelligent. And it came across like he also his confidence, I think, is partially sort of disarming mm. to people. Weird. But it, it comes across that he really knows what he's talking about and he's passionately fighting for this. But I already had a bit of sort of an anti SJW, I guess, kind of beliefs a little bit prior to that. But I was also like I was 20 years old. I didn't know a lot about politics at that time. So it's easy for someone to just show up and just sort of tell you this is the way things are, kid, and you just sort of believe everything. So, And so is that around the time that he was in this kind of uh, famous fight over uh, this piece of legislation in Canada yes. that uh, made him, you know, really got him into the news? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe you should reintroduce us to what exactly happened there. Okay, oh god, well this is <laughs> it's very complicated. You go through all of the facts in your piece. Yeah, so there's a lot of different aspects to it, I guess. Basically, there was this bill that was being introduced in Canada called C16. All it really did if you look at it was add the words gender identity and gender expression to this list of things that if hate speech is committed against you, like it counts as hate speech. And hate speech, and not in the sense of like, oh, I'm angry at you, but in the sense of you're advocating genocide against a group of people, mm. right? So the, all it did was just add the words gender identity and gender expression to a list of like 30 other things like sex, race, age, etc., of things that you could be discriminated against basically on. Now, he doesn't object to that because he twists everything into his own kind of <laughs> narrative, but he objects to the bill and associates a lot of negative things with it, I guess. And and one of the things that he claimed it was going to do was force him to to say gender neutral pronouns. And he viewed that as like a horrible imposition on his free speech. But I hope this isn't horribly confusing to people. 
because it is a little bit confusing. But there's this other piece of legislation Hmm. called the Ontario Human Rights Code, which Peterson lives in Ontario, so that would affect him, which had already passed. It was already law. And that actually does restrict you from misgendering trans people deliberately in a classroom context, not like just everywhere you go, but just in a classroom. But as I say, Peterson sort of takes everything, dolls everything up to 11 and just exaggerates the whole thing. But I guess I haven't really described the events that happened, but I don't know if you wanted me to do that. But As I understand it, he presented the issue as basically he could get hauled off to jail if he didn't conform with something that he felt was, you know, if he didn't speak in a way that he felt personally was unconscionable or or have you, and thus it was a terrible authoritarian move that would essentially determine what he as a professor ought to do in the classroom. Now, I think it is correct that there was not any realistic chance that he was going to go to jail if he didn't use the right pronouns. Yeah, no, there was no chance of that. I think it probably is the case that if a professor deliberately misgendered students, it would create an issue within the university, although it's probably unclear what would happen to a tenured professor in that case. Yeah, I don't really know what would happen. And I think it probably doesn't come up most of the time because most of the time a professor isn't really using pronouns very often to begin with and or their students because they're addressing their students you know by name and second most people just as common courtesy you know use the pronouns of their students but yeah i guess one one thing i'm sort of so he has this whole elaborate justification for why him refusing to use the pronouns is a very important thing to do and Mm. he basically believes that these pronouns are part of this larger sort of Orwellian kind of ideology, I guess, or system of creating new words, I guess, that are basically he feels that um, some kind of cultural ground is being lost Hmm. if we say the words they want us to say and that kind of thing. And, And his position was basically no step further. I'm not going along with this. I'm putting my whatever, like I'm stopping this right here. So we can have, I think a reasonable conversation about what the role of the government should be in deciding how people Mm. ought to treat one another and what kinds of consequences there ought to be if a professor disrespects or discriminates against students. Like I I, I think there are people who would come down more on the academic or more on the like professors should have employment protection side and probably meet people who would come down Mm. more on the no professors have an absolute obligation to be respectful towards students and misgendering isn't respectful. But as you've pointed out there, Peterson has this, it's not really just that he comes down on the professors should be, have more job protections against government regulation side. It's that he has a much broader almost kind of apocalyptic view that there are these forces of, you know, social justice, communist chaos descending Mm. upon civilization, doing all kinds of terrible things, and they need to be fought tooth and nail. When he, as you point out in your writing, when he said that Elliot Page had been butchered by a doctor or whatever he said on, on Twitter, and he was kicked off Twitter temporarily. He said he'd something like he'd die before he'd apologize. And I think he also said... You would rather die than delete the tweet. Rather die than delete the tweet. And when Justin Trudeau gave some like mild pro-vaccine message during the pandemic on Twitter, he said something like, over my dead body. He really considers himself to be in this kind of existential fight against evil. Yeah, no, that's absolutely the case. And Well, tell us a little bit more about the worldview, the sort of core Petersonian political worldview. Okay, so not related to his religious stuff or 
maybe intersecting with that as well. Well, well or to the extent that that is, you know, an inseparable part of it. <laughs> yeah. Because he often talks about things about how people like, he often talks about God. You know, say so he's a Christian, I, he might talk about Jesus, but he talks about God an awful lot and mm. like, uh, you know, defying God. And I think it's all wrapped together. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Um, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> but he has this theory of, postmodern neo-Marxism. I think that's a term that he basically created. But basically that the idea is that I guess in the 60s or 70s after communism was no longer acceptable to like support that these sort of intelligentsia, I guess, like Jacques Derrida, who became postmodernist, just like pretended that they were no longer communist, but actually they they were and they just were using different words i guess and and he basically sees social justice stuff as all part of that he thinks that equity is code for a quality of outcome and to him a quality of outcome is say, an explicitly marxist and not just marxist i guess but like stalinism basically mm. and so when someone says equity in his brain that means stalinism is coming like we better stop this so yeah. And then as far as the religious stuff, I guess, and he doesn't really come right out and say it. But if you look at the implications of what he says, it's kind of clear that he he thinks that you need to believe in a God to have any sense of morality at all. Hmm. And so when he sees a school shooting like the Sandy Hook shooter or the Columbine sh shootings, he attributes that to atheism pretty much as the cause and I guess he he basically believes that I guess the reason is he thinks that um, if you don't have some kind of like transcendent authority or something that like tells mm. you right from wrong, then there are no morals, I guess. There is no meaning to your life and you just sort of <laughs> suddenly yeah. pick up a gun and start killing people or something. Well, you mentioned uh, this kind of paranoia about creeping Stalinism, you know, which he applies to lots of things. I think that when he resigned from the University of Toronto, he had this opinion article explaining it where he's talking about yes. diversity, equity and inclusion programs, which he very strongly objects to. Um, mm -hmm. He calls it die. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. And, you know, suggests that this is the death of universities and possibly civilization. And during the pandemic, he was very anti-vaccine, you know, constantly suggesting that basically the line between Justin Trudeau and Joseph Stalin was a pretty, pretty thin one. And in some of his recent tweets and statements about climate change, he has applied the same kind of Manichaean thinking to his analysis of climate activists who are also, surprise, surprise, creeping Stalinists and authoritarians um, and woke Marxist whatever. But I'm always hesitant to, you know, just kind of mock this kind of right wing paranoia, because I think that it's important to understand why it appeals to people. And, you know, I, I do think that telling a kind of all powerful story, explanatory story of the world, you know, that allows you to make sense of everything that's happening and that puts you in a fight against evil. You're with the forces of good. I think that helps to explain the, both the appeal of Jordan Peterson and, you know, ironically, also the appeal of Stalinism to its adherents. <laughs> yes, for sure. I, and to sort of go back to like when I first was exposed to Peterson. I mean, there definitely was a feeling of, you know, listening to his, his first podcast with Rogan, like, oh, now I understand, you know, mm -hmm. everything clicks into place. Like, and um, that's part of what makes it like almost addicting to listen to him is you, you feel like you're really learning something deep about like the whole world or something like how mm -hmm. everything is really working and stuff. So but of course, now you are the uh, the writer of Jordan Pe the Jordan Peterson is wrong dot com. So this is where things get interesting. So tell us how you go from feeling like this man is just a bottomless well of profundity who has explained the world in a, in a totally new way and is very compelling 
you know, how does it begin? How do you begin to see kind of cracks in it? I mean, I assume it is not an overnight process where you wake up one day and you go, man, that, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> do you remember sort of how you began to change? You're absolutely right that it's it's not an overnight thing. It's sort of like what people say, like it's gradually and then suddenly all at once, like, I guess. So the way it started, I guess, was his debates with Sam Harris. Peterson did a number of like podcasts and debates with Sam Harris, who's, if people don't know, he's, an, he's a prominent atheist. So they were pretty much debating religion and the value of that and whether it's, you know, true, I guess, or not. I think one really important thing that I noticed was that Peterson sounds way more irrefutable when he's monologuing on his own. When there's someone there who has their own opinions about it and sort of points out the cracks in it, you start to go, oh, okay, maybe I agree with Sam Harris then. And when it came to the religious stuff, like at that time, so I've never been religious. I wasn't raised religious or anything. But at that time, I was like religion curious, like kind of agnostic, hmm. you know, I was very interested in exploring that. And, you know, maybe, maybe there really is a God and, and that kind of thing. And so that's part of my attraction to Peterson, but I also wasn't fully committed to that. So that's why hmm. I would listen to Sam Harris and not, you know, disagree with what he's saying necessarily. So, so I guess that was the start of it. And then of sort of realizing, okay, he's maybe not right about everything. And then later on, he also had a debate with Matt Dillahunty, another atheist. And in this debate, Peterson really just came off like an arrogant asshole, honestly. And I'd never seen him like that before. I'd never felt that way before. So with Sam Harris, he's a bit more polite, but for whatever reason with Dillahunty, he was just very impatient and sort of trying to pin Dillahunty on things that he didn't actually say. And I think one of the most interesting parts is like Peterson insisting that Matt Dillahunty is actually Christian, even though he's explicitly an atheist. He goes on speaking tours, uh, explaining why atheism is like the correct philosophy and not Christianity and so on. And I guess one, okay, here's the thing that really stuck out to me. So I'm, I'm a person that I really enjoy like art and fiction and music and mm. stuff. And Peterson said, without religion, there would be no art, there would be no poetry, and there would be no music, no anything. And I went, whoa, that is so not true. Like, what about all these atheist people that are made great things? So for me, that was the part that really like, whoa, like, that's crazy. So one thing I think that is interesting about what you're explaining here is that Sam Harris is He's with Jordan Peterson on the criticisms of wokeness and social justice, right? They differ on matters of religion. And mm -hmm. you said you bought into the Peterson critique of PC stuff. Yes. I think what is interesting about what you're saying then is that it sounds as if the first step here was not seeing Peterson seeing that Peterson was wrong about the things that you now think he is wrong about, but seeing that he was fallible by seeing him not be obviously persuasive or correct on an issue where you didn't actually have that much in a, of a stake in one side or the other. That's true. Yes, I was already open to sort of being persuaded either way. So yes, that's true. So yeah, so that was the start of it. And then in terms of sort of finishing this religion aspect of it. So I later like went to post secondary and I took this course on ancient Greek and Roman religion. And that really pushed me towards just being an atheist. Mm. And the reason is you look at their society, the Greek and Roman, ancient Greek and Roman society, and how Things were decided just based on religion. What do the gods want to do? Who is a god? Is Julius Caesar a god? Is Octavian a god? Well, I guess we should worship him then and he should be our leader. You sort of just realize, whoa, they did a lot of crazy stuff back then. And I'm, I'm glad that our society isn't 
organized that way anymore. I would very much like it to not go back to that. Sure. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so that kind of like shook me out of like, no, 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 like it, it matters whether the things you believe are factual. And that's kind of a place to draw the line, I guess. And so, but yeah, I was going to say, so in terms of other aspects, so I probably went a little too long on the religion aspect there, but so at the time that I encountered Peterson, I wasn't where I wanted to be in my life. You know, I had graduated high school and then I didn't go to post-secondary immediately after I was trying to do writing. And then I was just sort of like working part-time at like a furniture warehouse. There's kind of that vacuum after going to high school where it's like you in high school, you have all these friends and everything's sort of decided for you. You mm. know exactly what you're doing. You're being graded. So you know if you're doing it well. And then when you're out of high school, it's like, what do I do now? And so at first mm. you're like, oh, I have all this freedom. This is I'm free, you know, like for the first two months or whatever. And then, you know, a year goes by and it's like, oh, I'm still like not moved out of my parents' house, uh, which I thought I would have. And anyway, it's just sort of like becoming adult, I guess. And I, I guess people arrive at that in different ways. But like that was sort of where I was at when Jordan Peterson sort of entered. And when you're in that kind of place, having someone who's coming along with this very confident, like inspiring, certain kind of message of here's what you need to do to fix your life, that's really valuable. And I still, like I don't credit him for like helping me to like change my life or something, but you know, maybe a little bit because it sort of, it helped. So anyway, so later I, I ended up going to, to school and pursuing computer science. And so then at a certain point it's like, oh, okay, so I know where I'm going with my life. I'm actually achieving the things that I need to, to get there. You know, maybe it takes a few years, but I know that it's coming eventually. And when you're in that kind of a place where you, you have a structure, the self-help is not really as important anymore. You're not needing this sort of absolute meaning, absolute sort of simplified worldview anymore. There's a few things that are, that are very interesting to me about uh, what you're saying there. You know, first is going back to sort of where we, we started with the combination of the self-help and the political stuff. I mean, you said that you were persuaded by his critique of PC culture on the Rogan podcast, but it also does sound as if the kind of uplift and get your life together stuff was critical in in his appeal to you. And that it almost sounds as if by having your life change somewhat, you feel like it was more easy. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's easier for someone to see through this stuff if they don't need the uplift and confidence boosting portions of what he does. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It has less of a pull for sure, because you're not feeling the need to like listen to it as much, I guess. And, and also you're busy, right? You're busy with other things. You don't have time to just you know. Yeah, <laughs> they watch nine hours of <laughs> Jordan Peterson <laughs> Bible <Yeah>. study. <laughs> and then I guess the, the other component for like changing my mind was going to post-psychedary was like an important part where basically I learned like a more clear idea of like what critical thinking is and mm. like the value of logic. And, you know, some things aren't just sort of opinions, like there's a way of actually proving it and there's certain ways of doing so. One part of it was like taking a critical thinking class, like philosophy mm. class. I had a great professor teach that. And and that was like one of the first classes in post-secondary. So I was still very much into Peterson at that time. But I noticed like, oh, the naturalistic fallacy, that's something that Peterson actually kind of sure. does very frequently, like, or appeal to tradition, right? And so you sort of notice like, oh, okay. So you're very critical of a lot of his political assertions in your writing, including about the Canadian Human Rights Bill. But it sounds as if it's not that you took a class on critical race theory and you were like, oh, this this departs from the way he presented it. You took a critical thinking class. And we had a teacher, Sam Shane, on the podcast a little while back, who was talking about how he teaches his high school students critical thinking skills because you don't have to 
try to teach the alternate political worldview if you can just teach people the method of analyzing the mm -hmm. information they receive. And the moment you show someone how to analyze Peterson critically, then they can come themselves to the conclusions of, of where he's where he might be wrong. A critical thing is a very powerful thing to teach someone because a lot of things crumble when you start applying it everywhere you go. Yeah. I'm kind of shocked that it's not like required in high school. I don't understand that. <laughs> you would hope it would be, yeah. Like it's like, oh, I guess all these people who don't go to post-secondary, they don't need to think, I guess. Is that, <laughs> I don't know. Those things I just described about like their religion, changes in my life and like appreciating critical thinking, things that took a long time that it's kind of like, okay, here's where now I would be receptive to a critique of Peterson. This is a little bit calm. Well, Maybe I won't go into the full detail here, but basically I was listening to this podcast called the Here We Are podcast, which is uh, hosted by comedian Shane Moss, and he has on scientists. And he happened to be talking with, I don't know if it was a virologist or an immunologist or someone to talk about COVID. Basically, they were talking about this was in like early 2021, I think, before there were vaccines yet, but people were talking about that happening, I guess. So the anti-vax thing hadn't happened yet. Anyway, so they were talking about the lab leak theory and they were criticizing it. And then Shane Moss went on this rant against Brett Weinstein, who was promoting mm. the lab leak theory and basically saying like, oh, he's posturing as this like renegade scientist with a leather jacket and he's mm. completely wrong and stuff. So you have to remember, like when you listen to Jordan Peterson, you also end up acquiring all his other friends and stuff as part of your listening. So that Brett Weinstein, Eric Weinstein, the Jordan Peterson extended universe. Yeah, the IDW. Right. And so when I was hearing this on this podcast, I was like, oh, actually that I remember Brett saying something about the lab leak and it sounded weird to me. And so that seems right. And then Brett's also said a bunch of other things that I was sort of iffy about, like he had said when the George Floyd protests were happening, he was making implications to Rogan that we won't be able to trust like the courts because the court was going to decide on Derek Chauvin, I guess, and whether he was guilty or something. And Brett was saying, oh, we won't be able to trust like the outcome because the social justice mob, they're going to force them to make him guilty. And then Rogan was like, wait, but we have a video of sitting on the guy's neck for eight minutes. What are yeah. you talking about? So anyway, all that sort of went back and I was like, oh yeah, Brett Weinstein's kind of an idiot, I guess. <laughs> and I wasn't very attached to Brett Weinstein, so that was easy for me to do. And so then I went, oh, okay, well, what about Eric Weinstein? And I, I used to love Eric's podcast. He would talk about mathematical topics and stuff. But eventually I realized this guy's a bit pompous. He uses yeah. really big words to kind of... I mean, he is smart, but to basically make people really worship that he's smart. And I kind of had realized that prior. And so anyway, well, yeah, you know, Eric Weinstein is stupid, too. And so then the domino and the dominoes fall one by one by one as you start to, to go, hang on <laughs> yeah. a minute. I'm going to start critically analyzing the people that I'm listening to. <laughs> yeah. And so then basically what happened was I then I went to Google and I just typed in, it's basically like confirmation bias, but I was like, yeah. the Weinsteins are stupid. I just typed that into <laughs> Google and see what comes up. And eventually I got to your article called Pretty <laughs> Loud for Being So Silenced, oh, which yeah, kind of indicts yeah. the whole IDW as kind of hypocrites. And I was like, huh, okay, right. And you, of course, mentioned Jordan Peterson. And I was like, okay, well... Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein are stupid, and I used to think they were smart. So maybe yeah. Jordan Peterson, I don't know, maybe he is wrong too. So I click on your link to your other article, The Intellectual We Deserve, and read that all the way through and go, wow, all right. So Jordan Peterson is a little bit dumb, I guess, and he's a bit pompous, but he was right about the SJWs. He was right about mm. that. He was right about C16. But then I was like, wait, but in the article, Nathan said that he was wrong about C-16. And I was like, is he wrong? So then I just Google Bill C-16. I read the bill. It takes like two minutes to read. It's very short. And I realize there's no mention of pronouns in this bill. And so I just conclude from there, Jordan Peterson is a liar, basically. And then from there, 
later on, I'm like, okay, I want to write this critique about him. And then that forces you to even more carefully, like look at his entire Yeah. So. You start doing the research and you start. Yeah. Well, I, I'm very proud to have played a role here. But... Oh, no, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that article a lot. Well, thank you. I, a lot of people have, and I've had a similar reaction from a number of people who liked him at one point. But one of the points you, you made to me when you first approached us about this article is that there's a certain point at which you had to be ready for that critique. I mean, you suggested that my article, The Intellectual We Deserve, there are a lot of Peterson fans that it wouldn't persuade, even if it, it's persuasive. And it sounds like you yes. have gone through these kind of preparatory stages where a number of the dominoes had fallen. You'd, you'd come to see already through the Sam Harris thing that Peterson was fallible. You'd come to see through your analysis, you've taken the critical thinking class, your life has changed a little bit, and you start to analyze the wine scenes. And then, and only then, does Peterson start to finally completely crack and fall apart. <laughs> yes. I think I mentioned in my pitch to you, but um, I had actually come across your article, The Intellectual We Deserve, when it came out in 2018. So when I was like very much a fan of Peterson. At the time, it just like... I read a bit of it and it just like made me angry and I thought you mm. were being unfair. And of course, Peterson's sort of conditioned you to think, well, all his critics, they don't understand him and they're or they're acting in bad faith or infected with SJW ideology or something. And so I just interpreted it in that way and I didn't read the whole thing and I just it just sort of made me mad and I just forgot about it. That was the first time I read it. <laughs> We're running out of time here, so we have, to, we have to conclude, I'm afraid. So what I want to do, though, is to, looking back on what we've discussed here, this process by which you changed your mind, a lot of people think it's impossible for people to change their minds on politics. I think that's wrong. I think you probably think that's wrong, considering your own life experience. But it also does sound, from your last answer, like it is the case that if you approach a critique that contradicts your existing political ideology, it can be very, very hard to take it seriously and that things need to happen gradually and sometimes in a certain order in order for you to change your mind. So Peterson's worldview, to me, one of the reasons I'm so sharply critical is because I find it very dangerous because it's Manichaean, right? It's a battle against the forces of evil. It's paranoid. It's unfair to the other side. It doesn't listen. It's not empathetic. It's very angry. And I really do feel like all of those traits are not helpful towards building a functional society where people get along and listen to each other and try mm -hmm. to sort of muddle through their and, and work out their differences. So I find it very dangerous. So I want to figure out, you know, how do we take people who do believe and think and see the world as he does? And how do we change minds? And so perhaps I could conclude by asking you, based on your own experience of becoming a fan of Jordan Peterson, really believing you know, very profound, and then sort of slowly changing your mind. What do you think the lessons that we can take from your experience are as to, you know, if we want to change minds, if we want to persuade people, what it will take? Okay, so for the person trying to persuade, this is the advice for it. Yeah, what are the lessons that we can learn from this about what changes minds and what doesn't? Well, I think name calling is not a good, or just being inaccurate, I guess, or not giving credit where credit is due. I think mm. all of those things just don't help, I guess. Yeah. Well, one thing that strikes me is that I think we've tried to do here today is that it's really important to understand what it feels like to be the other person and like how the world looks to them and why, like, I try and understand why people believe. Oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right that the empathy is critical and like, you might have to do a lot of research to like gain that empathy, like just sort of, you know, like I'm sure you do, you read the books of these people that you critique and stuff. Yeah. And that takes a lot of time and energy. And but you get a better sense, I would say of like, how they think and stuff. Whereas if you just see a clip of Jordan Peterson, or whoever it is, and that upsets you, and then you make a clip critiquing him, you might not have a very realistic way of going about it. Or I think one thing that is really not good is when you just instantly accuse them of bad faith or call them a grifter or something. 
for someone who's a fan of Jordan Peterson and you just call him a grifter, I mean, mm. from their perspective, Jordan Peterson's helping them get their life together. So how could that person be a grifter? And that person's fighting for the truth and like freedom of speech aren't those good things. So you have to, it takes a lot of effort to like explain it. Yeah. Now, I don't like accusations of bad faith generally, because I think, first off, they're very difficult to prove. And I also think that most people are actually operating in good faith and believe the things that they say, even when they're delusional and wrong. Like, uh, I don't think there are that many people who are actually operating in bad faith, or at least that's the conclusion that I've come to after reading and watching a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad we got to have this conversation, Benjamin Howard, because, you know, it would be very easy for me to call on a, a fellow disparager of Peterson and we could just talk shit about him for an hour because God knows I like talking shit about Jordan Peterson. But <laughs> that's the easy thing. I think the hard thing and the more important thing and the thing that you have helped us do today is to go, well, okay, but like if we're going to neutralize the appeal, we have to understand it first. Mm, for sure. And if people want to read your critique of Peterson, come to after a long intellectual journey... They need to go to jordanpetersonisrong.com where they can sign up for the mailing list so that when Benjamin Howard finishes his ongoing critique of Jordan Peterson's worldview and ideology, they will be the first to know. That's jordanpetersonisrong.com. Benjamin Howard, thank you. Or if you're listening in the future, the critique will just be there on the website as well. So yeah, just to make that clear. Go to jordanpetersonisrong.com. Benjamin Howard, thank you so much for joining us today on Current Affairs. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening.